Hello, and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast. I'm your host, Heather Tesco. This episode, I'm going to talk about the quest to find the Northeast Passage. Yes, you heard that right, the Northeast Passage. In the mid-1550s, everyone was fascinated by the idea that you could, perhaps, get down to Asia by going north and east around the northern coast of Russia and down into the Pacific Ocean that way. And thus came about the Muscovy Company, which must be one of the most unknown of the different companies of merchants around, a sad little sibling to the East India Company, for example. But the Muscovy Company had a heyday that lasted nearly a 100 years, and it only completely fell apart during the Russian Revolution. So let's start at the beginning. In the mid-1500s, everybody's going exploring, right? The Spanish and the Portuguese are going crazy in South America. The French are trading furs in Canada. The Dutch have New York. Every seafaring nation seems to be getting a piece of the newly discovered lands in the Atlantic Ocean, right? Except the English, who are lagging thanks to their religious turbulence and a king that, while he may or may not have been crazy, was certainly more interested in his marital life and recapturing the glory of war with France than with claiming land in the Americas. Oh, there were some early English explorers like John Cabot, and certainly Henry was aware of what was going on in the world. His father, Henry VII, had financed exploration with John Cabot, but England lagged woefully behind the other countries. So, in the mid-1500s, everybody is getting exploration fever. The other countries were busy looking for the Northwest Passage, and England got clever and decided to look for a Northeast Passage. Sneaky! The driving force behind this was a man named Sebastian Cabot. He was the son of John Cabot, and he was born in Bristol, but he worked in Spain for much of his life. He became the pilot major, and while he was the pilot major in Spain, he learned so much about the way the Spanish and the Portuguese were navigating. He had access to their maps and to their globes and the way they were navigating, and he learned so much about the newly discovered lands on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. So Sebastian began began to believe that the riches of the Pacific Ocean could be reached by going north and east, and he desperately wanted a country, any country, to try it. He started talking to Henry VIII's ambassador to Spain, Dr. Edward Lee, and there was another Bristol merchant who lived in Seville called Robert Thorne, and the three began to hatch a plan to have England try out the new Northeast Passage theory. It would take many, many years for such a voyage to finally come about. There were many, many letters written to Henry VIII. There was interruption when Henry died. Sebastian Cabot had to move back to England. Lots of letter writing. Lots of funding needed to be secured. But Cabot really stuck at it. And he and the ones who believed in him were talking it up and getting lots of publicity and traction and funding. And while they were talking, they met a young man named Richard Chancellor. He embodied all of the new learning that Cabot was familiar with from Spain. England at the time didn't really have a navy, navy, and they hadn't really done a lot of exploring beyond the coasts. So English fishermen would fish off the coast in familiar waters that the, the knowledge of which was passed from generation to generation. They would go to France, and that was really about it. There wasn't much exploration beyond what was familiar. So people didn't really have the navigational skills to read maps and to understand astronomy and be able to tell where you were by how the stars were. Um, and Richard Chancellor had studied all of this, and he really understood it and had all of these modern skills. And so Sebastian Cabot really wanted him to be the captain of at least one of the boats when they finally secured funding and permission to travel. So finally in 1551, a group of merchants and explorers formed the Company of Merchant Adventurers to New Lands. The full name was the Mystery and Company of Merchant Adventurers for the Discovery of Regions, Dominions, Islands, and Places Unknown. Say that ten times fast. And they were formed to look for the Northeast Passage. Hugh Willoughby, who had been a hero in the wars against Scotland, was drafted to lead a group of three ships northwards. 
they were they got off to a good start, but then they were delayed by bad winds. They were stuck off the coast of the northern part of Norway, where they suffered from horrible, fierce winds and storms. Um, and one of the three ships, captained by Chancellor, was separated from the other two. So Chancellor kept going north towards the northern tip of Norway. There was a fishing outpost there that they had heard about, and so they had all agreed that if they got separated, they would meet there. And so Willoughby was there waiting, but he also was was conscious of the time, the fact that time was passing by, and he needed to get moving before winter came. So eventually he kept going. Um, and years later, they would find out that Willoughby also got to that point and kept going, but then he wasn't able to navigate as well as Chancellor. He kept going along the coast of Russia. He got stuck in pack ice, and he wasn't prepared for the cold, and all of his men died, um, and there's a theory that they were actually, they died from carbon monoxide poisoning because they did have a stove, but the ventilation down in the bottom of the ship wouldn't have been very good, and, um, and so they were found by a Russian fisherman the next year. So back to Chancellor, who survived. He managed to get past Norway and start to sail towards the northern coast of Russia, made it into the White Sea. So these Russian locals were amazed at the huge Western-style ship that was coming into their harbor with the sail, and it must have just been amazing to them. Um, and they were able to help him get to one of the larger provincial towns where representatives of the Tsar were able to meet with him. So the Tsar was Ivan the Terrible, and he heard about the ship, and he summoned Chancellor to Moscow to meet with him. And that was a journey of another 600 miles in the snow, along the ice and, and all of that. Um, Chancellor had described Moscow as much larger than London, but built mostly out of wood and much less sturdy. But the palace of Ivan the Terrible was really luxurious, and the Tsar seemed willing to talk about trading with England. Russia didn't actually have a secure route to the Baltic Sea yet, and they were in the middle of wars with Poland and other Baltic states, and all of the other routes were contested both by the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and the Swedish Empire. So Russia was actually really stoked to talk to England and to have this route that they could perhaps get to Europe without having to rely on, on the Baltic Sea. So Chancellor goes back to London. He gets back the next year. He still doesn't know what happened to Willoughby, but he's carrying with him a letter from Ivan inviting trade as well as he brought back some Russian furs. By that point, Mary was queen, and she rechartered the Merchant Adventures Company and called it the Muscovy Company in 1555. And then Chancellor went back to Moscow again. This time he had cloth and other goods from England for trade, as well as diplomatic ambassadors. The Muscovy Company became the diplomatic link between London and Moscow, and several years later, <laughs> Ivan actually proposed the idea of marriage to Queen Elizabeth. She declined, one assumes very politely. So, poor Chancellor died in 1556 when he was returning from Russia on that second voyage, and he got stuck in a storm off the coast of Scotland. He actually managed to save the life of the first ambassador from Russia to England. His name was, I'm totally going to butcher this, I'm so sorry if you speak Russian, I really apologize. His name was Osip Nepeya, N-E-P-E-Y-A. Don't know how to say it, but there you go. Um, he was on board, and they had a, a he had a harrowing few months um, being held hostage in Scotland. Finally, he made it to London, but it was at the expense of Richard Chancellor's life. So, um, moving forward, in 1577, Queen Elizabeth gave the Muscovy Company a monopoly on whaling in the waters around Spitsbergen, which it claimed based on the idea that Willoughby had discovered and claimed the land on his fatal journey. And after Chancellor's death the, death, the Muscovy Company funded several other attempts to find the Northeast Passage. One of those attempts made it through the Kara Gates into the Kara Sea in the Arctic Ocean, and they also funded two trips of Henry Hudson in his search. So, by the mid-17th century, the English Civil War was disrupt disrupting trade, and the Dutch swooped into the vacuum and started becoming the main traders with the Russians. By 1917, the Muscovy Company had ceased operations, though it still exists as a charity and supports the St. Andrew's Anglican Church in Moscow, 
1994, the current Queen Elizabeth visited the original company headquarters, which is not far from the Kremlin. So I want to talk about the legacy of the 1553 journey, which is much more long-lasting and made more of an impact. So first, England was able to sell goods to a less developed economy than they were with selling to Europe. And that was the first time that they had this opportunity. When they sold cloth to Europe, it was in its raw form because European cloth finishers were so much more experienced than the English. But when they sold to Russia, they could sell finished cloth, which meant that they needed to learn more techniques themselves. And they started actually a small early industrial revolution 200 years before the main one. It also taught them lessons in how to trade, which would serve them well during the age of empire building. Also, the nature of the company was that people could simply put money in to invest without having to go on the journey and risk their lives. This was one of the first times that people could put disposable money into a venture and watch their returns come back while not taking an active part in the venture itself. The Muscovy Company had major early losses, including the loss of ships and cargo, as well as men, but they persevered and were able to become an economic success and provide good returns for their investors. Later on, other companies would form this way, including the Levant Company for trade with Turkey, Syria, and Persia, as well as the much more famous and successful East India Company. It was in the trade of these joint stock companies, which were sanctioned by the crown, but were happy to leave the work to private citizens where the root of the British Empire was formed. Also, many of the intellectual ideas that formed the English Empire were based on the idea that trade with native peoples and understanding of those people would create lasting wealth. So it's easy for us from 21st century eyes to look back and say, well, it didn't always work out that way. And that sounds a little utopian for how it it worked out. Um, But consider the memo that Sebastian Cabot wrote to the sailors of the 1553 journey, where he ordered the men to respect the people they came across, to speak of God in general terms, and not to argue over theology. He encouraged that matters of faith and ritual should not be discussed. Sailors should seem to, quote, bear with such laws and rights as the place has where you shall arrive, unquote. In general, people of every region were to be treated with all gentleness and courtesy, and shown no point or sign of rigor or hostility. Though, eh, he did suggest that you could get native people drunk as a way to get information from them. Sensible, but probably something we would raise our eyebrows at. Not only were these instructions, um, quote, consider you that they are also men, unquote, declared a letter signed by Edward VI. Um, These were humanitarian instructions, but it also made mercantile sense so that people would show interest in the English merchants. This paved the way for the English Industrial Revolution and the age of the English Empire. So that's it for this week, you guys, except the book recommendation, which is Merchant Adventures, The Voyage of Discovery, Which Changed Tudor English, England by James Evans. I'll put a link up to purchase it on the blog. You can also visit the blog to send me comments, story ideas, or other general thoughts. And I'm and um, yeah, the address is http colon slash slash englandcast.com. Again, englandcast.com. Or you can also find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash englandcast. And also, you know, I don't really mention my other writing here very often, but I do have a regular blog um, on interesting random bits of history and music and art and random interesting things um, that I blog at, which is curatory.com. It's spelled with a K, K K-U-R-A-T-O-R-Y.com. So you can stop by there for random interesting bits of interestingness. And so I hope to see you there sometime soon. For those of you in the U.S., I hope you're getting prepared for a wonderful Thanksgiving. And I know my podcasts are sporadic. If anyone wants to babysit for me, I could do them more often. In the meantime, have a wonderful holiday, and I will speak with you again very soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Send for baby sweating, blow northern wind, blow, blow, blow. Ich hoot a board in Bauerbricht, that's all is Sam Lee's on sea. 
Mensch voll meiden auf Licht, fern und freit von In all this world, flesh of one, Burr of blood and of bone, Never yet in Ustenon, Gott zum Herr in London.